Hi, this is Charles Geba of ACASignups.net. In my last video, I talked a lot about stools, but today I want to discuss pools. Not this type of pool, or this type of pool, but healthcare risk pools. There's been a lot of concern in recent months about an executive order by Donald Trump to remove restrictions on short-term and association healthcare plans. Why is this such a problem? To understand that, you have to understand how risk pools work. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, one of the most respected sources for reliable, accurate healthcare policy data, in the United States, around 1% of the population eats up a whopping 23% of total healthcare spending. When I say spending, I'm talking about the amount of money which actually ends up going to healthcare providers, doctors, hospitals, clinics, drug companies, medical device makers, and so on, regardless of whether it comes from the insurance companies, the government, or the patient themselves. That 1% includes people with really expensive ailments, like some types of cancer, hepatitis C, rare specialized prescription drugs, and the like. Around 50% of healthcare spending is used on just 5% of the population. Around two-thirds is used on 10%. In fact, Kaiser says that half the country eats up a whopping 97% of all health care costs, while the other half only uses 3% of it. According to the National Health Expenditure Report from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, in 2016, health care spending nationally, including everything, Medicare, Medicaid, the ACA, the VA, the Indian Health Service, all private insurance, whether employer-based or purchased individually, all premiums, all co-pays, all deductibles, all of it added up to around $3.3 trillion. There's around 320 million people in the U.S., so that breaks out to over 10300 per person. To simplify things, for this video, I'm going to round that off to an even 10000 bucks a head. Nearly half the U.S. population is covered by employer-sponsored insurance, and another third is enrolled in either Medicare, Medicaid, or CHIP. That leaves around 50 million people or so. Around 16 million are enrolled in ACA individual market policies, Around 5 million are enrolled in other assorted non-ACA policies like grandfather, transitional, student, farm bureau, short-term, or association plans, and around 29 million have no type of coverage whatsoever. Of those 29 million, about 13 million are either eligible for Medicaid or the CHIP program, are caught in the Medicaid gap, or are ineligible for Medicaid or ACA policies due to their immigration status. The remaining 16 million are those who could enroll in ACA policies, although many wouldn't be eligible for financial assistance. All of this means that this is about the 16 million currently in ACA plans, the 16 million uninsured who could enroll in them, and the 5 million in those oddball plans I just mentioned. Now, let's say the entire individual market population was evenly represented by 100 people, all part of the same pool. At 10,000 bucks a head, Total healthcare spending for those 100 people would add up to an even $1 million. Of course, as I just noted, that $1 million isn't broken up evenly. Some of these 100 people, mostly the younger ones, will be quite healthy. Others will have a few sniffles. Others may come down with a sprained ankle or broken bone. Others will need surgery for a hip or knee replacement, or perhaps will have a heart attack and need a coronary bypass. Finally, a few will be stricken with cancer, diabetes, or other expensive ailments which require chemotherapy, radiation, dialysis, or other really expensive treatments or medications, in some cases for the rest of their lives. According to Kaiser, of that million dollars, 50 of these people will cost very little to treat, just $600 a piece, let's say an annual physical and perhaps a couple prescriptions. Another 30 or so will cost about $5,000 a piece. Maybe they had a pretty healthy year so far, but they have to go to the hospital once to be treated for, say, a kidney stone, like I did last year. Five of them will cost $12,000 apiece, five will cost $20,000, five will cost $32,000. That brings the total up to about a half million dollars. Again, that's 95 people, bringing up 50% of the total. Of the remaining five people, four of them will cost about $68,000 apiece. Well, the last person would cost a whopping $230,000 a treat for one year. Before the ACA, all 100 of these people would go to an insurance carrier and say, I'd like to enroll in a major medical health care policy, please. And the insurance company would say, hold the phone there, Sparky, and would demand every detail about their medical history. I mean everything. Every operation, hospitalization, every doctor visit, every prescription medication taken or prescribed, every x-ray, every blood culture, every lab test, the works. Some of those records could be a royal pain in the ass to get a hold of. Then the carrier would pour over all that stuff and have their actuaries crunch the numbers to see how high or low a risk they figured the prospective person was of developing one of those really expensive treatments. Basically, how likely they were to fall into that top 10% of people who eat up 66% of medical costs. That's called medical underwriting. 
If they decided that person was high risk, they tell them no dice and kick them to the curb to try somewhere else. Alternately, they might say, okay, we'll sell you this policy, but you're going to have to pay X times as much as a healthy person would. In short, they could cherry pick their customers so that only the healthiest, or those who they thought would remain healthy, could get in, while everyone else who was sick, or who they thought would become sick, was told to go pound sand. Of course, if you lop off the most expensive 10% of the population, it means that costs for the other 90% are suddenly far lower. You've just eliminated two-thirds of the medical expenses from your risk pool. So instead of it costing $10,000 a piece, it suddenly only costs $3,800 each to cover each of them. Congratulations, you've cut your medical costs down by 62%. This is the single largest reason why pre-ACA individual market healthcare premiums were so much lower. Other major contributors included charging people with those conditions far more and not providing coverage for major healthcare services like prescription drugs, maternity care, and mental health services at all. However, there is a rather obvious problem with the kick 10% to the curb strategy. The 10 people you just threw under the bus are still out there, and they still have really expensive conditions. In fact, they average around $66,000 a piece to treat, or 17 times as much as each of the other 90. What the hell are they supposed to do? Now, I suppose you could just let them die, but there's two problems with that. A, it's immoral, and B, there's no knowing which of the other 90 people are going to find themselves on that high-risk side of the aisle tomorrow. Healthy people develop cancer. Healthy people get into car accidents. Healthy people have troubled pregnancies. Everyone will likely wind up with at least one pre-existing condition at some point in their lives. Therefore, assuming you are a human being and have a soul, you have to come up with a reasonable way of properly caring for all those folks. Now, last year, House Speaker Paul Ryan was pushing hard for a return to the days of high-risk pools, which is what most states had before the Affordable Care Act. I wrote a whole screed on Twitter at the time about how lousy an idea this was, which gained a lot of attention. As a refresher, here is basically how it worked. Anyone who was deemed untouchable by the insurance industry was given the option, in most states, of entering a state-run high-risk pool, which was supposed to be funded by the state. The idea was that if you were too expensive for the private industry to accept, the state was supposed to cover you instead. On paper, in theory, this would seem to work. Charge those 10 high-risk pool enrollees the same 3800 that the private policy enrollees pay and have the government cover the difference, right? Problem solved. Except that 66000 minus 3800 equals over $62,000 a piece for the government to cover them properly. If you don't include those with employer insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, or CHIP in the equation, you're talking about 10% out of around, say, 50 million people. That's about 5 million people, which means it could cost up to $300 billion per year to properly fund these pools. Think that sounds insane? Well, it is, but it's also not far off base. According to a Commonwealth Fund estimate, it would have cost $178 billion per year to cover most of those with chronic pre-existing conditions, and that was in 2014. With normal inflation, population growth, and including 100% of the target population, it would be about $215 billion. And that's assuming the enrollees were paying a larger chunk of the cost themselves. In a state like Michigan with 10 million people, that might to amount to 150,000 people costing the state over $9 billion per year, out of a total state budget of around $55 billion. Needless to say, most of the states weren't willing to raise taxes by 17% to properly fund their high-risk pools. So instead, they did what they could to keep costs down, and in many cases did whatever they could to make it difficult or impossible for people to actually enroll in the program. For instance, again, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, the actual high-risk pools included all sorts of ugly traps. For instance, premiums were usually up to twice as much as what everyone else paid. Just about all of them still denied coverage of pre-existing conditions for 6 to 12 months, which means that yes, even a program specifically designed for those with pre-existing conditions would deny those very people coverage for the very pre-existing conditions they needed coverage for, for up to a year which means that you are pretty much SOL if you were diagnosed with a form of cancer which would kill you within 12 months without treatment. They often included lifetime limits on coverage, usually in the $1 to $2 million range. Remember, using our example, at least one of these folks cost $230,000 per year to treat, which means they'd be completely screwed within four years in some states. And there are some patients who can rack up to $1 million in expenses or more per year. And finally, if all else failed, some states just skipped past any pretense at all and simply put a cap on how many people they'd enroll, leaving some folks out in the cold altogether. As you can imagine, while there were a few exceptions, most of these high-risk pools ended up kind of sucking. The thing is, when you isolate 10% of the population from the other 90%, 
it's a lot easier to screw with them by underfunding the program or imposing draconian rules. And keep in mind that this tended to be the most vulnerable population with the fewest resources available to fight back. It's hard to yell at your congressman when you're in the middle of a chemotherapy session, and you can't donate too much to advocacy organizations when all your money is going towards your treatment. In part two of my risk pool video, I'll try to explain why Trump's short-term and association plan executive order would take an existing problem and make it much, much worse. Meanwhile, I'm Charles Gaba of acasignups.net. If you'd like to support my work on an ongoing basis, please become a patron at patreon.com slash charlesgaba, or if you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can do so at gofundme.com slash acasignups. Thanks.